Now, I am enormously excited to be here uh, with these people today. I've been thinking about it for a long time. Um, uh, I think that I am the perfect person to be chairing the event because I was reflecting that when I was um, an unemployed teenager, I uh, fell in love with short stories and I wanted to write them and it was, I was besotted with, um, with Raymond Carver and, and the minimalists and uh, so I spent all my doll money on typewriter ribbons and stamps, which gives you an idea of how old I am. <laughs> and I just kept on sending off my stories to every publication I could think of and no one ever wanted them. But the publication I most wanted to get published in was called Australian Short Stories, which was um, started by Gwen Harwood and Bruce Pascoe in the years before he was Bruce Pascoe, um, <laughs> uh, along the, the Great Ocean Road here somewhere, I think. And uh, one day I received a letter back from them and I thought, here it is at last, the acceptance. And I opened it up and it was from Bruce. And he said, dear Michael, uh, I've noticed that you send us stuff all the time and you will have noticed that we never publish it. <laughs> he said, one thing that you need to understand about the short story is that it is a story. Yours, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I didn't take the tip and I continued to try to write short stories and they continue not to be published. So today, we have three of the finest practitioners of the short story, and we can all learn what it takes to, uh, to make a great short story. Contestant number one, would you like to <laughs> introduce yourself, tell us who you are and uh, where you grew up? Uh, hi everyone, I'm Melissa Manning. I grew up in southern Tasmania, and uh, as Michael said, I'm a short story writer. I had a, a collection come out last year, Smokehouse, um, and I wrote both um, short stories and, and longer form fiction, but I'm particularly drawn to, to the short story form and um, all that it can offer to readers and writers. Is there a short story writer who you particularly love? God, there are so many. Um, I have to name these guys, of course. <laughs> Not just because they're here, but because I genuinely love their work. Uh, I think Josephine Rowe is an extraordinary short story writer. Um, she's not currently living in this country, but, but she was. Um, Jen Down, of course, is also uh, an amazing Australian short story writer. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are too many to name. There are so many, but those are some standouts. Contestant number two in the Alexander McQueen shirt. <laughs> your name, and um, tell us a bit about your background. Um, firstly, is it true that you have changed your name legally to Miles Franklin's shortlisted <laughs> author? <laughs> Michael Winkler? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> That's what I heard. Good um, name. Uh, my, my name is Chris Flynn. Uh, I was born and grew up in Belfast, um, the real Belfast, uh, not the one you guys have, uh, uh, and um, moved here in 1999 to escape the Y2K bug, which I assumed was going to destroy the world, <laughs> and um, have lived here ever since. Um, became an Australian in 2007, although are you ever really an Australian? I don't know, because people still, you know, tried to mock my accent every time they meet me, which, please don't do that. Um, I am an author. Uh, I've, this is my fourth book um, for adults. It's my first book of short stories. I'm sort of best known for my last book, which was called Mammoth, which came out at the start of the pandemic, talking from the point of view of fossils at a natural history auction. Um, this follows on from that, in that it is um, from the points of view of animals and non-living things, such as an airline seat um, and a hotel room. There are narrators in the book, as are some uh, other animals. I'm the editor in residence at um, Museums Victoria. I got the job because of Mammoth. They hired me to help bring their collection to life. And the fact that they had bought a Triceratops at the time, uh, the most complete Triceratops ever found by humanity, which opened earlier this year, that exhibition. You can go and see Horridus, the Triceratops, if you like, at uh, Melbourne Museum. And I've created a suite of books uh, to accompany that exhibition. Um, so uh, that's me, and um, you're going to ask for who my favourite story is, right? You're right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say, Australian-wise, uh, Thea Astley, um, who's a big influence on me um, for her energy and just um, couldn't give a fuck attitude um, to the way things are done. And um, Tony Birch, uh, who's a really good mate of mine and writes really, really gritty, realistic um, Australian stories. And overseas, I'm going to say George Saunders, 
for his um, imagination and um, also a bit of an influence on this book. So that's my three. Wonderful. And uh, George Saunders has his next collection coming out in the next four weeks, I think. So that's one to watch for. And at the end of our panel, tell us about yourself. Okay, sure. Um, my name is Chloe Wilson. Uh, my collection is called Hold Your Fire. It came out last year. Uh, before that, I actually published a couple of collections of poetry. Um, the Mermaid Problem and Not Fox Nor Axe. So I have a background in poetry before publishing fiction. And uh, I grew up in Melbourne in a suburb called Williamstown, for those of you who know it. So enjoying the maritime vibes here. So Chloe, um, you were best known uh, in the past as a poet. How does your practice as a poet connect with your short story writing? I think in term, I think the thing that really connects them is that I listen for the sound of language. I think that um, I have, in poetry, it's so much about how, not just what words mean, but how they sound and their length and the texture of them and where you put spaces. And I think that I have carried that over into short fiction, so I started by writing flash fiction. Um, they were, some of the stories in the collection are very short. The shortest one's only 100 words long. And um, they, the stories gradually grew in length from there. And I think it's that, that kind of listening out for, to, ma to make sure that it's striking the right note. There's the, uh, the, the, are you familiar with the American writer Richard Brodekin? Sort of. Sort of late, late 60s, early 70s, and he once said that you had to learn how to write poetry in order to learn how to write short stories, in order to learn how to write novels. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, but I, but I, I do like that idea of um, honing your skills and uh, learning techniques along the way, which can help you with a, as the stories expand. Mm. Yeah. To give you a little bit of an example of what Chloe's talking about, um, the last, uh, her, her more recent poetry collection, Not Fox Nor Axe, the, uh, the first poem in it is about the women who knitted in front of the French guillotine. And she says, uh, they fiddle with their needles while they watch the bouncing heads. It was a distinction never to flinch, to continue inching out the curve in a heel or an elbow, the grip of a sleeve to its wrist. So you can see there that idea of rhythm and language and spaces. But I'm interested also in how they are unflinching witnesses, and your stories are so unflinching. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about that? I think it's just what I'm drawn to. Uh, I think um, I'm really interested in trying to get to the, the truth, not like some kind of objective truth, but the truth um, beneath social interactions or beneath kind of uh, polite, um, yeah, uh, s social mores, I guess. And uh, I think that, that that's why it comes across as unflinching is because I'm, I'm trying to look past and through things to get to something true. People have used words like dark magnificence and terror in the ordinary. Um, are your story, is there terror in some of your stories? I, well, yes, I think there is. I think that there's um, a terror of, of the, the bodies that people live in. Um, and so, for example, um, there is a story about um, two sisters who go to a health retreat because they're both convinced that they're very sick and... Um, and then things only get worse from there. Um, there's a story that, that begins with somebody getting a fecal transplant, and there's this sense of um, trying to keep this, this bodily coherence together all the time, that while, while bodies might be betraying you. So that's one kind of terror in the collection. And I think it's also just um, the, the terror of maybe latent violence when there's a difference in power between people as well. There's a lot of, I find, um, well, I think there's a lot of interlopers in my collection, people who maybe are less powerful entering the spheres of people who have more money, more privilege, and and trying to find their way. And there's 
their position is always a bit precarious. There seem to be a lot of characters at war with their bodies, um, uh, whether it be the, the, the two young women who um, go off to the, the purges or um, uh, the diver who is wrestling with um, trying to make her body do the things that she wants it to do. There's pimples and dandruff and vomit and, and blood and all these things um, within rather smooth sort of suburban settings. What's, what's happening there? I think that that is the nature of everyday life, that uh, everyone's going about their business seeming like, like things are going well or at least okay, but there's, there's chaos and violence always just under the surface, always just waiting to emerge. Chris, your collection, I, I should have asked beforehand, it, it, it's on sale now? When, when did it actually hit the shelves? It came out on Tuesday. Okay, um, this is a scoop. So <laughs> this is my first time talking about it uh, in public, so this will be a good testing ground to see if I'm if I actually know what I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's called uh, Here Be Leviathans. The word Leviathan appears once in the book, Chris. Tell me this, is it in the story, Here Be Leviathans? Jesus. No, uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, it's a bit different story. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, that's no. Okay. Um, Chris, which, which story is it in? Uh, the, the one after Here Be, Here Be Leviathans. Um, the... Oh, the... The ship one, I think. The Strait of Magellan. Yes. Mm. Oh, okay, if you say so. <laughs> Interesting, <laughs> if not all that relevant, uh, sidebar. Um, I, in my notes, I wrote down first-person stories. That is a completely uh, inadequate description, and could you explain why? Um, yes, so I've always... Ever since uh, Mammoth, I've been obsessed with this idea of looking at humanity from the point of view of the outsider, the non-human whether it's animals or even just the objects around us. I love this idea. It's a very sort of science fiction, Philip K. Dick idea of um, sentience um, that exists outside of us. Um, that, you know, the, the, the piano is sitting there, but maybe it's listening to us and has an opinion on, uh, on us and, and how we behave around it. And that would be an interesting perspective to, 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 to see how the piano perceives this event. Um, so that's the uh, technique I've used for this. So the nine stories are from the point of view of, to very quickly run through them, uh, and most of these stories are actually based on something real that has happened. So the first one is a grizzly bear um, who has eaten the brain of a teenager during a fun run in Alaska <laughs> um, and then inherited his memories. Um, the grizzly, there was a grizzly bear, did um, uh, uh, eat the brain of a teenager on a fun run in Alaska not, not long before I went there. The teenager was taking a shortcut to try and cheat. That didn't work out too well. Um, the second story is from the point of view of a, an airline seat on its last day of usefulness, and it's a workplace story. Um, <laughs> the, then there's one about uh, a saber-toothed tiger in a futuristic theme park who's been cloned back to life. And you might have seen in the news about the thylacine and their there's a lot of talk about them actually bringing it back to life. There's actually talk about bringing back the saber tooth as well, uh, amongst a host of other animals. And so he's in a futuristic theme park where people have to play um, cavemen, and uh, uh, that all goes badly wrong, of course. There's a story um, set in a, a colony of platypuses or platypodes, however you, where, you, where you wish to say it, um, who are uh, the product of a, an experiment in a lab in Queensland who can uh, talk, think, and have enough sense to keep your mouth, their bills shut about it. And they rescue some German backpackers from a crocodile and then put on a contemporary art show in their den. Um, there's a story from the point of view of a super yacht off the coast of Chile um, uh, during a viral outbreak. Um, and, but it's from the point of view of the yacht who thinks it's of itself as a, a safe place for people. And the stowaway on board who is the virus, you hear the virus's point of view. Um, there's the story of a space monkey, a rhesus macaque monkey um, from the 1950s who was shot into space, was the first monkey, Albert Six, codenamed Yorick, who, um, who survived um, being shot into space and made it back to Earth. Um, true story. Um, I'm running out of stories here. There's the hotel room story, um, where an hotel room narrates the 
uh, love life and sex life of a couple who keep coming back to the same room over a number of years and is trying to help them conceive a child. And then the final story is from the point of view of a human, um, and it is a young uh, homeless girl living in the tunnels under, underneath Las Vegas and in the abandoned casinos of Vegas, and that's based on um, some real people that I met when I was working for The Big Issue and went over to Vegas to um, look at how it was affecting um, the, the, how the uh, stock market crash a few years ago was affecting people there and how everyone was um, living on the skids in Vegas. So that's a brief summation of the, uh, of the very foolish narrators I've chosen to tell these stories in. Chris, it feels like there is a danger that it could be gimmicky or tricksy to um, give yourself this task. Um, I'm here to tell you that I felt something for the aeroplane seat. You know, it, 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 it was actually, an, it, it, I, I felt emotional at, at the end of that story about yeah. what was happening with the, with the aeroplane seat. How do you locate the, um, the heart in stories while still um, taking on a, a high wire act of, of, of yeah. narrative from a sometimes non-sentient Yeah, yeah, means. this sort of idea of compassion for the voiceless, you know, and I think it's quite prescient in our society, you know, there's a lot of voiceless people in our society and it's, it's you know, and we've, it's so easy to forget about people um, and um, neglect them and I, I think by telling these stories from the point of view of um, objects or animals, then it, it introduces that idea of empathy and compassion for, for the forgotten. Um, I worked at the RSPCA for five years um, whilst I was writing Mammoth, and that's one of the reasons why I was able to do it, because every day I worked in the cattery, um, as it turns out, Chloe was volunteering in the same place at the same time, yeah. and we never met. Um, uh, and I was working in the isolation unit of like sick and injured animals that were recovery, in, in long-term recovery, and they speak to you, you know? We all, all, all animal owners will tell you that their animals speak to them in some way or another, communicate in some way or another, right? And that, and I became fascinated with the idea of, um, I suppose, interspecies communication and um, how do other species or um, perhaps even the objects around us, how do they communicate with us and, and um, interact with our lives? And so it, it is a high wire act, but um, I love that sort of challenge, I think as a writer, I want to always feel like I'm pushing to the limit of my ability, and if I'm not doing that, then I'm not doing my job properly. One of the things I love about these three books is how different they are. M Melissa, um, your collection, can I call it Much Loved? Everyone, that would, that would be nice. Everyone <laughs> who I mentioned that I, that, I was going to, uh, that I was going to be speaking with, oh, I love Smoker. It, it, it seems to... Melissa actually changed her name to Much Loved author, <laughs> <laughs> Melissa Manning. <laughs> Um, what aspects of, of your book have people responded to most? Uh, I think it's the sense of connection that's conveyed through the stories. Um, that, um, that feeling that you get about who it is that you are as a consequence not just of the relationships that you have but of, of the places that you live and the way that you interact with your environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think also um, my stories are all, are all linked, so you can read each of the stories independently, and, um, but you can also read it almost like a novel in mosaic. So it's, it's giving you that broader picture of, of the lives of the people in this particular community in the Don Tricasto Channel in southern Tasmania where it's set. And I, th I think that's what people have responded to most when they've spoken to me about it. Because th that's right. But um, what differentiates your collection is that you've created a world and um, populated it with your characters and all the stories, with a, a little uh, excursion mm. to, to, to Europe uh, within that within that place. Is that is that the exact place where you grew up? I lived there for I think about three years, but and when I was quite young, so from year I was probably eight to eleven. Um, but there's something about that environment that's stayed with me and um, in the earlier session about setting, you know, that it really struck me what um, um, all three authors said about that sense of, and, and Lucy in particular, that sense of we don't just um, make our environment, our environment, and our environment makes us. And so, um, yeah, I think, 
Um, I wanted to convey the, the broader picture of, of a community and broader lives um, and the way that we move in and out of each other's lives and, and kind of those, those small moments and interactions with, um, with the places we live and how the history of a place uh, interacts with um, the future of that place in, in a way that's kind of not necessarily of human making. Um, you know, the animals that you interact with, um, the, the smells, um, the breeze coming off the sea, the view, uh, all of those things give you, provide some sort of an atmosphere to it, I think, not just a background for your life, but the, the making of your life. In the earlier session, which set the bar extremely high, yeah. um, uh, Jennifer used the word multi-sensory, and uh, in your stories there is, you know, the feel of the rungs of a ladder under a, a bare foot, or what cold water feels like, or, or hot water, or mm. the smell of baking bread. How important are those, uh, those elements in building your fictional universe? They're really critical because I, th I think, you know, that's, as Chloe was saying, that's like, this is how we live. These are, life's, we have these very visceral experiences and often quite raw experiences. And we spend so much of our time in, in Western civilization, you know, in rooms and in plural lit spaces. And we're so deprived of, um, of much of that interaction with the natural world. And so, I mean, not to say that you can't get those experiences in, in man-made environments as well, but I think for me it's um, those really close connections with, um, with nature uh, are really important. And, you know, food, we, there's a generosity um, about sharing food and making food for other people and, and eating food is, you know, is this incredibly pleasurable and, and, and sens sensual experience yeah. often. And so I, I wanted to convey the way that the, the, the small things of our everyday lives are actually what make our life. Chloe, I lost count of the number of references there are to different perfumes in your stories. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, and to different smells and aromas. How, how, do, how do you use that, that sensory information to help lead the reader into your world? I hadn't, I mean, there is a story about perfume in, in the collection, but I hadn't actually been conscious of there being that much perfume in there. <laughs> Otherwise, now I'll go back and, <laughs> and see it all and think, oh. Um, I think that... I can't remember where I read this, but that it's something like the brain can take in 20 pieces of information at once. Don't quote me on that. I'm just I'm I'm kind of flying by the seat of my pants here. But the the gut can take in like a million, or and I think that we perceive a lot and know a lot before we make a conscious thought about it, and that information arrives via our senses. So. Um, it's, and, and you know, smell is very important. Smell is kind of telling us, uh, give, conveying all kinds of information about um, whether something is uh, pleasurable or disgusting, whether it's safe or unsafe, whether this is a person you want to approach or not, um, about where you are, about weather, about all kinds of things. And so I think that it's, um, I, I guess trying to communicate with that like unconscious mind as much as anything else. That and I also just really like perfume. <laughs> <laughs> Chloe, while well, I've got you, another really interesting thing I thought about your collection was um, you are very happy to write unlikable first person narrators. That's a, a rarer thing than some people might think. Tell us about that. People keep saying this to me, and I keep thinking, I like them. <laughs> <laughs> I like them. Maybe I'm just unlike anyway. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't necessarily see them as unlikable. I see them as telling the truth, telling the truth about what they really think, about what they really see, and uh, what is motivating them. Um, beyond what they're willing to admit to other people. And, you know, I must confess that a lot of time when I come across characters in books who are nice and there's nothing else 
no like no grit no kind of flaw no ugly hunger or desire going along with that i find those characters less credible um maybe that just says a lot about me i don't know but um i guess uh, yeah i'm drawn to other characters um in literature who would be considered unlikable and i'm, I'm drawn to the writers who create them um, and I didn't actually ask you earlier, what, what are some of the short story writers that, that you follow or have inspired your work? I think most of all Shirley Jackson because she um, received the most complaint letters <laughs> out of, um, <laughs> I think there were like sacks of complaint letters arriving into the New Yorker after the lottery was published and um, I can Could only dream Could you just explain that. about the lottery? And, oh, okay, uh, sure. I mean, without maybe a spoiler, but what, was, okay. what makes that story so shocking? Has, can I get a show of hands? Like, who knows it? Just so I'm... I don't know. Okay, not that many people. Okay, so it was a story, I think it was published in the 50s, and it, it's called The Lottery, and it opens in some kind of bucolic little town, and there's going to be a lottery, and it's it happens on, I think, one day every year, and everyone's kind of... It, the story opens, and everyone's talking about the lottery, and where and they're all sort of going in and gathering in this space where it's going to be held, and it's done in rounds where it's, um, you know, the group of people still being considered to be the winner of the lottery gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you find out who it is. And then the story takes a turn. <laughs> I, I won't ruin it. I will tell you to go and read it. For those of you who like to listen, there's also um, an episode of the New Yorker Fiction podcast where someone reads it, and that's really wonderful too. But people were so shocked by this story. People were cancelling subscriptions. People were complaining about it. And it's, um, it's now just like a legendary short story. And her other short stories are wonderful too. Very strange, unsettling, happening in small towns, domestic interiors, quiet streets, um, where people are very strange and a little evil. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you're better known as a novelist. Let's talk a bit more generally about short stories as a form. Um, at the end of, uh, of this book, you write, short stories are misleadingly named. They take ages. <laughs> I'd like to hear from all of you on that. <laughs> tell, tell, tell us about that. I think there is a bit of a misconception that, um, that you know, stories are a way into learning writing and, and you know, heading towards novels, and so that they can be sort of dashed out pretty easily. I, I find them very, very difficult to do. I think they're harder to write than novels. I think, in a, I think in a novel you've got a much more leeway with yourself and with the characters. You can overwrite things then cut it out later on. But I basically treated these in that same respect, which is why it took me so bloody long to do it. Um, about 10 years, really, to do this story collection. And as you would have read at the end, a, a lot of the stories were much, much longer and got cut down. Um, and um, I think one of the problems with story generally is that how long is a story? You know, and this idea that stories must be either you know, 2,000 words long or 80,000 words long and there's no room for anything in between, I think is a real, uh, a real um, difficult problem we have in publishing. Um, and sometimes you have an idea for a story and it's an awkward length. It's 20 or 30,000 words when you write it. Well, who's, what are you going to do with that? You can't send it into the New Yorker. You can't send it to a literary journal. It's not long enough for a novel. Just for context, Chris, what, what's an average novel? Average novel is probably anywhere between 75 and 100,000 words for, for a slightly longer one. Um, and um, I think Mammoth, my last novel, was about 70,000. Um, and some of these stories were forty to 60,000, and then I had to just pare them back. And we've all read novels where clearly the person had a great idea, but that idea runs out of steam about 100 pages into the book. Uh, but they've obviously thought, well, I need to stretch this out. Um, and, and, and they undo the work that they've done prior. Um, so I was quite conscious of that. So for me, stories I find very difficult. I, I kind of treat them like journalistic assignments. I do so much research, a lot of it field research, I actually go to a lot of the places and, you know, um, the grizzly bear, I went to Alaska for Christ's sake and um, <laughs> was potentially almost eaten by a grizzly bear. I've got a great photograph of the grizzly bear who was way too close to me. Um, and, uh, but I have to have that sort of um, ex experiential um, um, uh, sense for a story to work for me. Um, I kind of love that you're both talking about that. Um, 
you know, the sounds and the smells and everything. Um, you reminded me of, about how uh, when I was in Berlin a number of years ago, I went to a, um, a restaurant where ev all the staff were blind and the restaurant was pitch black. And so you, as a, as a diner, you were led, there was a lit room, you, a, a blind waiter or waitress came out and led you in. It was complete absence of light. It was absolutely the darkest thing ever. And they led you by the hand to your table and served you an entire meal and explained to you how to eat and how to drink. You had to put your finger in your glass so that you could feel how, how full it was whenever you're, you're pouring your own water because you were left to your own devices pretty much. And they would explain where things were on the plate when they put it down uh, by using the clock face and say, uh, your potatoes are at 10 o'clock or whatever. <laughs> um, but it was an amazing, disturbing sort of experience to be denied that sense. And your other senses are then heightened. And um, you know, the waiter or waitress would just suddenly be standing right next to you and you're unaware of them being there and they'd whisper in your ear, how is everything? You're like, ah! <laughs> and if you had to go to the toilet, you had to basically you know, shout, help me, and, uh, and someone would come and lead you to the toilet. You had to do that yourself, obviously, but, um, <laughs> um, but that, you know, that sort of was a, quite an interesting experience for me as a writer to be denied a sense that is so important to us and, you know, talk about empathy and, you know, uh, trying to understand um, the experience of someone that you are not. That was, uh, was uh, very interesting. And talking to the waitress, she'd been blind from birth and had, did not understand what colors were, had no conception of color. Um, and I tried to explain to her you know, what red and blue and green were. She, she said, I, I can, cannot understand what you're talking about. Yeah. And what a great experience. Yeah. And, but that sort of stuff, that, um, that uh, uh, experiencing the world through the senses, it's so important um, when, you're, when you're a writer, um, even if it's not always possible. And uh, I think that with the stories in, in your collection, um, you really, really feel that research and that knowledge that underpins, undergirds each story. And fascinatingly, at the end of this collection, there's, uh, I think it's a really generous thing. And apparently it happens more in sort of spec fiction and, um, and, and, and science fiction. Um, but uh, Chris has given an explanation for each story, where it, where it comes from and, uh, and what it's what its shape was originally, and, and I, I can recommend that. I was telling uh, Chloe that uh, during the Commonwealth Games, I was watching the diving, and I felt like I had an extremely new appreciation for everything that was going on. And I said to her, you know, obviously it's because of your background in diving, which is how you could write that story. And she said, I don't have a background in diving. <laughs> so what, what sort of research goes in to, to underpin... Your story. Why was I convinced that you were a diver, that you'd played lacrosse, and that perhaps you had, you know, some sort of technical scientific background? Well, yeah, I've I've never dived. I think what drew me to write about it was just that I find the idea so horrifying, um, and that people are in training to climb up up to a ten meter platform and just do it over and over and over, and because there is genuine danger in it. People have died doing it. So um, that's that blows my mind. But uh, in order to do research, I mean, thank God for the internet, right? So I do a lot of, you know, Google is a wonderful thing and it's not just, it's about going past what you can find initially. And I was digging around finding charts and watching a lot of old competitions and reading books as well, um, biographies written by Divers, turns out there aren't that many of those, but you know, you do what you can. And I guess also then drawing from my own experience of being in situations of danger, of, uh, and danger where you've put yourself there consciously for some kind of reward, uh, because that's quite different to finding yourself in a dangerous situation abruptly. Um, the, yeah. It's um, a lot of research and a lot of really uh, doggedly getting past the obvious and trying to find the really small details, I think. Um, Melissa, Chekhov talked about, uh, he called it the engine of he and she. And these days we would probably say he, she, they and the combinations within that. Mm. After all these years, 
it's still those interactions that can drive a story forward and it's the way that people are with each other. There's late in, um, in the title story, you say, um, Nora tried to swallow the stones of their changed life. Isn't that a wonderful phrase? Tried to swallow the stones of their changed life. So we're so invested, uh, particularly in, the, in, that, in that title story, with what's happening with, with Nora. What's the, what's the power of human relationships and interactions? It's not everything, but it's but it's it's a lot of what life is. I think, isn't it? Um, you know, we obviously have our um, interactions with with animals and the natural world as well. And as Chris so beautifully writes, with inanimate objects. Um, but I, I think the emotional heart of, of where life lives is um, the way that we feel um, when we're interacting with other people and. And I'm really interested in the ways that our lives take shapes that we don't expect. Um, you know, we, I think most of us have these kind of loose plans or maybe firm plans for what next or what we think our future might look like. But the way that our lives map out usually winds up to be quite different to that. And, and I'm really interested in the way that, you know, there are those tiny moments that can shift things to make a person into another person, really. And, you know, there are the, cat the, cat the cataclysmic events, um, like in now, the Now story, um, where a, a young girl loses her family in the tsunami. But I think more often our lives shift as a consequence of, of those sort of smaller interactions with the other people in our lives. and. Um, and I'm really interested in the context of that, in how little control we have over all of it and how there is so much opportunity for um, pure joy in the darkest of circumstances and, um, and that idea that, you know, we sell ourselves this idea in Western civilization for some reason, I think, that happiness is kind of, it, there's an end game and happiness is it and then you'll be happy. But that actually just isn't how life works at all. You know, life is, has moments of darkness and light and, and it's all blended up and you kind of get what you get and... And then you die. And, and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. And then you come back to life in one of Chris's stories. <laughs> Um, obviously, one expression of that uh, that connection between between humans and, and perhaps uh, animals in, in Chris's book. I'm reliably informed in 2022 that uh, people are still having sex, but it's notoriously uh, tricky to write about. Um, on page 34 of your book, <laughs> and I know because I've, I, it's well dog-eared. There is a moment when. Um, someone comes into Nora's life and takes off his boots. And I read that paragraph about three times and I thought, I reckon we're on here. There's something <laughs> going on. There is something very erotic about the way that he takes off his boots. Mm. Now, you, you bravely, um, you, you write about sex quite a bit in, mm. in, in your book. Um, tell us, is it, a, is it as tricky as everyone says to, to write about? And how is it done well? Uh, I, I don't know if I do it well, but... Um I, d I don't think so because I see it as, you know, it's this thing that most of us do, you know, like we pee, <laughs> you know, like we eat, it's like we breathe, it's, it's a natural, um, it's a natural thing for us to do and so I, I guess you've got to be careful about straying into that cliche or making it, um, I don't know, it can be icky I suppose if it's written the wrong way. Uh, and in my stories, it's never there because I go, oh, well, we need something a bit salacious and interesting here. It's just because this is naturally what the characters are going to do now, um, you know, as people do in their lives. Mm. Yeah, and I think, you know, maybe some of those interactions are, you know, some of those interactions are quite kind of animalistic and some of them are more, um, you know, more sensuous. And I think that also speaks to 
you know, our various experiences of a sexual nature. There was a lot of sex in my first book, and um, A Tiger in Eden, back in 2012 or something. And um, uh, people would come up to me at events, um, women, and confess that they were reading the book in bed, and that then they got all excited and turned over and had sex with the husband. Um, as was so if you buy Chris Fling's book... <laughs> Well, exercise caution because um, one woman got pregnant <laughs> and, and, and kind of blamed me. Um, I missed out on the fun part of that, of that uh, con conception. But, well, it, but so it, it, it has made me a bit gun shy, so I, I, I'm, I'm a bit like, cautious about doing sex now. So you've had all your sex now. Yeah, it's all you done. say that, but there's actually a, a, a really remarkable oh, story in, right. um, in, in your book where... Perhaps it takes more than two people to create a pregnancy yeah. sometimes. And it's, a, it's not a thruple, it's a quadruple perhaps. And uh, you, you, in, the, in your notes, you, you say that if, if the rare thing, a story where people aren't punished for, uh, for their loving relationships. Right. I, d I did want to write a sex positive story, I think. Um, and it's called A Beautiful and Unexpected Turn. And it is the penultimate story in the collection. And it's the one from the point of view of the hotel room. And it follows a young couple over a number of years as they keep returning to the same room and you see what's going on in their lives and the struggles that they're having and um, the pressures they're under. And I suppose it's not giving too much away to say that uh, um, eventually they turn up with another couple in tow. And, um, and that seems to work very well for everyone. And um, I did want to um, be a bit transgressive with, with the sex and um, introduce this idea of... Uh, Happiness in, 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 within a couple, you know, uh, a loving relationship, they can still be uh, uh, experiencing pleasure and, um, and are willing to share it with, uh, uh, with another couple who have helped them and they form a little community and it works out very well. Um, so, me, and the hotel room, of course, is perving and all this uh, and <laughs> considers itself to be the sort of fifth person or the fifth you know, entity in, in that relationship. Um, Chloe, a, more of a, a craft question, I suppose. How do you book a reader? <laughs> oh, and then, how do you have sex, Chloe? <laughs> no, I just didn't. I was just like, ooh, yeah, that's good. I'm going to get quizzed about that. I don't understand the mechanics of it all. Like, how, how does it work? <laughs> Somebody tell me. No, um, there's only bad sex in my book anyway. So, oh. <laughs> As you were saying. How do you hook a reader, take them along, and then let them go? With, how do you know what the, what the, what the release point is? <laughs> I think that... I, I don't plan it consciously, but I think you know when you've written the ending, even if you then keep writing. I think the ending sounds and feels like the ending, like there's a kind of weight, a, like a cadence to it. And then sometimes you go on and say more, and it's not until later that you go back and read it and think, oh, that's the actual ending. I, I can let the rest of this go. Um, sometimes the reader doesn't need all of the information. They just need something that has that resonance. And, and they can you know, imagine the rest. Apparently, the editorial department at The New Yorker, that's one of the things they specifically do. They get stories. I guess it's a great story, but the person keeps going after the ending. Mm -hmm. They just cut the last paragraph of your story and say, no, it actually ends there. Mm -hmm. that was a, that's a very common thing. That, that shocked a lot of writers when they said, no, I, loved, I wrote this beautiful last paragraph. Like, no, you didn't. You <laughs> yeah. yeah. And there is that temptation, I think, for some writers to treat a story, a piece of fiction, like it's an essay and do a little kind of Resume in thing. conclusion yeah, I yeah. and, you know... It's Look how clever I am. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't give the reader a lot of credit, does it? Mm. I mean, I think those stories that leave space for the reader... Um, are much more satisfying. Yeah, I, think. I agree. Talk amongst yourselves. No, uh, I've, I've lost my book. Uh, here we are. Um, when I talk about um, hooking the reader, I'll give you an opening line from a story from each of these collections. So, uh -oh. from Smokehouse, <laughs> from the, the story Boy, Harry sat in the ute, window down, and watched from across the road. Tell me you don't want to know what happens next. <laughs> um, Chris has already talked about um, his, his first story in, in this book, but it's only uh, 
the first sentence is only seven words long. I ate a kid called Ash Tremblay yesterday. <laughs> uh, and Chloe has exquisite opening, um, uh, opening lines. Uh, and um, uh, Robert Gott uh, was saying uh, last night, he thinks that the title story, Hold Your Fire, he said is one of the great Australian stories. Um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. I won't read the famous opening sentence from that. Instead, the opening sentence of Powerful Owl, Owl, which is, the first part of Maya to wash up on shore was a foot. <laughs> you want to read on. Um, uh, uh, Hold Your Fire, which, which Robert called one of the great Australian short stories, I, when I read it, I didn't think it was it was based in Australia. It, it, it has a, a, a universal sort of quality. And in fact, I feel that in a lot of your stories, and I'm not exactly sure where they're set. Why is that? Well, it's because of my terrible geography. I frequently... I never know where I am. Um, <laughs> once, famously, um, my friends had booked a holiday house in one coastal town, and I told my husband it was in a different town, and we drove there. <laughs> Um, if I go outside and I'm trying to find where the car's parked, I'll always walk the wrong way. I can't read a map. I, for, up until quite recently, I thought that the map faced the way you were looking at it. Like the idea of like turning the map around is quite novel for me. So anyway, um, wow. yeah, yeah, it's like that. So for that reason, um, I, I do not write, try to do a lot of geographical specific plotting. I think... In writing, as you know, as you get more experienced, you kind of you get to know the beast you are. And I write, so I, and also it's it's just what I'm interested in. I write a lot of more chamber pieces that are in interior spaces, and um, I guess therefore aren't geographically specific. Although sometimes I think the language will be Australian language. Um, you know, I've had when I've had some of the stories published internationally, they've wanted to change, you know, various things. What, like Australian slang and so on? Yeah, just, uh, I guess, um, things that you don't necessarily realise are specific until somebody doesn't know what it is. Um, now I can't think of an example. What, like but a bin or a trash can? A yeah, ute. Sort, sort of, of thing, like a, a tap and a yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. All of that. Now I've been monopolising these people and I have about a hundred more questions, but uh, I'm conscious of time and I'm also conscious that... Uh, this is an opportunity to learn from people at the top of their game. So if anyone has questions, and there's one down here, and there's one up there, that is fantastic. Um, let's, let's hear them, yes. I'm afraid my question is for you. What did you start doing differently that made people like Bruce Pascoe publish your story? <laughs> um, I, uh, the other day I drew a graph. Um, I was doing something for the South Australian Writers uh, centre about self-publishing, and I drew a graph and I showed them that I've been, I've written fiction in every one of the last 40 years, and that I've had fiction published in six of those years. So that means there's 34 years in which I've written fiction and it hasn't been published. So um, I think I just got a little bit better, but only incrementally, because my short stories are still really bad, <laughs> but much better after listening, hearing from these people today. Yeah. Right at the back. Yep, how do you cut it down? Um, it's a nightmare. Uh, um, uh, there's something wrong with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could be more brief with some of the stories, but um, and it was there, there, there's a sadness to it, right? Um, like the grizzly bear story, which is I think about nine thousand, um, was originally sixty thousand, and you saw the whole life of the grizzly bear after it's been shot and um, goes off into the mountains and. Um, and I kind of loved that, but I think I was just, um, uh, my brain was just working something out that the reader doesn't need to hear. And I'm giving myself sort of context. Sometimes I'll write um, backstory for characters um, and then just never use it. Um, and it's just for my purposes as a creative, I think, to be able to better understand the characters that I'm dealing with. Um, it, it was a nightmare, though. We argued and fought, um, my publisher and my editor. There were many different versions of these stories over the years. Um, there were stories that never made it in that were incredibly long and had taken me months to do. 
um, that we ended up cutting because we just thought they weren't right, they didn't fit thematically with the collection. Um, but yeah, there's definitely something wrong with me. Um, I, I mean, just sitting here today in this room full of people, and I'm looking at that empty chair, and I'm thinking about, it's right in the front, the, the chair's staring at me, the, the, the chair's watching this event. That chair has turned up with the rest of you to hear about these non-living, um, I'm glad you put your bag on it, that's good. That's good it was freaking me out, that chair. <laughs> More questions? Yes. I am. I'm trying to. I have an 18-month-old at the moment, so it's just it's a lot of mom time. But um, yeah, I am gradually, gradually putting a new collection together. Yeah, things. Melissa, you wanna? Uh, it's just part of the deal. You just, you know, you just have to keep going, and they, and I think, you know, there's probably not an author out there who hasn't had rejections along the way, um, and I think if if you're serious about wanting to be published, if that's your motivation or part of your motivation for writing, then um, you just have to accept that um, not every story is for every mag or every comp, and you know, and sometimes, you know, and the other thing I've judged quite a lot of short story competitions now, and um, I would have to say that I would be really disappointed to think that those people whose stories don't quite make the short or long list um, just bin those stories because there are many, many really good stories that have potential and maybe just need a little bit of a tweak here and there, um, and you know, so. I would hope that people persevere. Um, you judged the Peter Carey I did, short yeah. story. Yeah. Have you got any brief reflections on what separated the, 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 the best stories from the rest of the stories? Uh, there were stories for a start. Bruce <laughs> Presto! <laughs> yeah. I mean, you need those echoes, you need those connections, you need the weight of that final line. And a final line is, you know, I think critical. Um, to leave the reader with, with a real sense of satisf satisfaction. And something different as well, you know, I, I guess, you know, both Chloe and Chris write, you know, so imaginatively and, um, and I think a lot of people are writing very imaginatively in the, in the short story space in Australia at the moment and, and that's really exciting to read. But something that gives you some uh, an, a, a emotional response is um, the most critical thing, I think. I think rejection is quite an interesting thing as a writer. Um, I, I don't really fear it, and um, I actually I take a perverse pleasure in it sometimes, um, um, because I think, oh, you know, you get so caught up in what you're doing and so convinced of, that what you're doing is is good, for then someone outside to say, no, I didn't like it. It's like it, to, to me, I'm like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Like, why, why, why didn't you like it? I, I don't take it. I don't take it hard. I'm like, oh, how dare you criticize my genius? I'm sort of the opposite. I'm like, oh, is it is it no good? Okay, let's. Oh, oh well, then it has to it has to be changed. I'm I'm quite good at like accepting that sort of feedback from people. Um, you astonish me, Chris. What? <laughs> oh, that that, that that seems an extraordinary. Uh, is it? I think it's extremely healthy, but it, it oh. amazes me. Chloe, can you does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, I agree. I think failure is so important. I think it's essential and. Um, also, as a writer, it's, it's important to get used to the idea that even when you do succeed succeed and have something published, that there are still people who aren't going to like your work, mm -hmm. who would never publish you on your best day of, mm -hmm. you know, of your writing career. And that is just part of it. And especially if you're going to be as distinctive as you can, be as much yourself as you can, you, there's going to be a group of people who are really attracted to what you're doing and some people who just aren't. And that's, that's okay. On a practical level, um, you know, when I was starting out as a writer, something that I found really helpful for rejection is don't just have like one piece that you're pinning all your hopes on that <laughs> you've sent to one place and you're like waiting by the inbox. If you have, I mean, I know it takes a while to build up enough work to do this, but if you have a lot of submissions out, if people allow simultaneous submissions, so sending to more than one place at once, take advantage of that. Have, you know, 20 things pending. And then that way, if you, if you get a rejection, it's like, oh, well, we'll see how the other 19 go, you know, rather than feeling, um, I think it helps not 
you would feel less crushed, basically, I think is what I'm trying to say. Uh, uh, and I'll offer a fourth view, which is that I think it's really unfortunate that um, writers who, uh, most of them, are sensitive and uh, a lot of us feel that what we write is a small part of ourselves, mm -hmm. that we uh, have to operate in this industry where you do get crushed so often. Uh, I wish that sometimes that I was building um, brick walls or, or something uh, where it wasn't quite so. Oh, I thought that, that just, just the other day, I thought that um, <laughs> I've had to do bookstore signings this week for this book and there's reviews starting to appear and I'm just like, why do I do this? <laughs> I, I'm just going to go back and work at the RSPCA and clean up shit. <laughs> that was an honest profession. <laughs> I reckon we've got time for one decent question or two quick ones. So this is your chance. Yes, over here. Can you actually make a living as a short story writer in Australia? <laughs> <laughs> you, you probably can't make a living as a short story writer anywhere in the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have a full time job. Yeah, um, I have a part-time yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. You've got both. I have five full-time jobs. <laughs> yeah. Chloe, yeah, no. Chloe, however, has been uh, in the uh, notoriously lucrative poetry world. So, well, that, I, yeah, I got that poetry money. <laughs> slumming it in the low-pay short story. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I had to leave all that glamour behind. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> she's had the big poetry backs that yeah, she's used it. to. To answer your question with some hard data, Sorry, though, um, yeah. because I, I have access to BookScan through my work at the museum, so I have been looking at you know actual sales for a lot of books, and, and particularly in the build-up to this coming out, I've been looking at short story collections in Australia for the past decade to see how, how well they actually sold. And the best-selling short story collection in Australian history is Nam Lee's The Boat, which sold about 150,000 copies, which is an extraordinary amount for any kind of book, let alone a book of short stories. But after Nam Lee... The, the drop is precipitous. Mm -hmm. And the current best-selling short story, Australian short story writer is Tony Birch, whose short story collections sell about 4,000 copies. His novels sell better than that, but his short story collections sell about 4,000 copies. And, and, and he's still simply allowed to school curriculum. Excuse me. In, in the first book, Luke Wedge says in the 60s, he grew up on short stories. Oh, so short stories were taught in the schools, yeah? Yeah, right. Yes, I think I did the loaded dog three years in a row. But it was <laughs> <laughs> Didn't we all? <laughs> we, we have time for one real quick one. Yes, in the front here. Um, my question is for Chris. I'm interested in you saying how you avoid anthropomorphising your non-human characters. <laughs> how do I avoid anthropomorphising them? I sort of, it's kind of my job, actually. Um, the museum hired me because I um, had brought the fossils to life in Mammoth. And now my remit at the museum is to bring their collection to life. So I am literally, I, earlier this week, I had a meeting um, with, I, was, I went into work and they said, oh, you've got a 10 o'clock meeting with the, um, the preparators. I'm like, the what? <laughs> well, okay, it's in the basement, right? Went down there um, and there was this very elderly man in a white lab coat covered in blood. <laughs> and he said, uh, come in. Um, and I didn't know what this was about. And... He was showing me, um, they do taxidermy and so on, so he was showing me how they do it. There was a guy sitting there who had a squirrel, and he had just flayed the squirrel. Its, it was, its carcass was there, and he had its skin, and he was sewing it. I mean, you could have warned me what I was getting into. <laughs> and they said, oh, do you want to see our wedge-tailed eagle? Do you? Yes, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> and they took me into a room, opened the drawer, and the stink, and it was a, a wedge-tailed eagle carcass being consumed by beetles. Oh, yeah. And because the beetles strip all the flesh off the bones. But I am looking at these things with the eye to, like, um, I, could I tell the story of the wedge-tailed eagle, um, even though it's dead? Um, it doesn't bother me, anthropomorphization. Um, I kind of like it. Um, if, if it sort of induces empathy or compassion, then I'm all for it. And museums all around the world are starting to do it now. Um, the reason why I was hired to create the voice and personality for the Triceratops is because um, the Field Museum in Chicago have a Tyrannosaurus who has its own Twitter account <laughs> and interacts with people. So I had to create um, a social media personality for this Triceratops, which the museum then got cold feet on because they're terrified of the trolls and what will happen whenever they go out into the social media world on Twitter and the voice of the Triceratops. And could I say that if anyone could do that, Chris Flynn could do it. Um, <laughs> could you please thank...
Chloe Wilson, Chris Flynn, <laughs> Melissa Manning. <laughs> And they all have their books here, along with uh, everyone else who's appearing at this fabulous weekend. So I urge you, buy their books, get them to sign them, and it's a cast-iron guarantee you will not be disappointed. Thanks.